like to introduce Dr. Greg Tatara. Um, Dr. Tatara is a MSU grad. Uh, he is the utility director for the Marion, Howell, Osceola, and Genoa um, water and sewer utility and working for the Genoa uh, Osceola Sewer and Water Authority also. So he will talk with us about design considerations for water and wastewater systems, really focus on those aspects as engineers. So I'm going to turn it over to him. I'll shut off my video. And thank you again for being here. OK, so hopefully everybody can see my screen share. Um, so um, I just think yeah, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some design considerations from an operator's perspective. Um, I'm a huge proponent for my operators. Um, I think they have one of the most difficult jobs in the world. Um, really came to light over the last you know year and a half with COVID. You know they never took a day off. Um, we you know we worked in our plants uh, day in and day out, and um, you know they have very tough jobs. We work 365 days a year, um, seven days a week. You know sometimes all night. Um, during storm events and such. So um, operators deserve a lot of credit. And I think as we design things, we should design things for operators in mind. So that's kind of what my focus of my talk is today is talking about some, you know, the design considerations with regard to an operator's perspective. So first thing is operational flexibility. I think as you go through a design in the future, anything you can do to provide operators with as much flexibility for all the different environments and conditions they're going to encounter is key. Um, you know, there's so many variables to contend with. So, you know, demand changes significantly. In our systems, uh, between winter and summer, our water production goes, will increase four to 10 times, you know, given how dry it is outside when people use water for irrigation. So that's a huge, you know, huge thing to consider when you talk about water quality in the distribution system, aging of water, you know, preventing trihalomethanes and things in the water. So, you know, having a design that can meet those different demand conditions is, is key. And giving them the flexibility to lower tower levels and 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 you know shorten cycles and provide disinfection throughout the distribution system rather than you know only at the plant and stuff is key. Um, storm conditions: our, our wastewater flow uh, will double um, and quadruple sometimes during heavy storm events, um, like we had this past year. And you know, with climate change and such, it's it's only going to become more and more. Um, difficult to do that. And that's even though we have separated sewer systems, you're still going to have an infiltration and inflow component. Um, changing regulations and emerging contaminants. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. You know, um, things are getting more restrictive. Um, there's new contaminants on there. And our traditional systems aren't designed to always remove these things. And I think we're going to be looking at, you know, new ways. And it's going to be challenging from an economic standpoint to meet some of those requirements. Uh, population changes, you know, we're in a community here that's growing very rapidly. So our demand is continuously increasing, but you have some populations that are going to be decreasing and how do your designs, you know, allow for the system to adapt to that. Um, maintenance and repair shutdowns, you know, we have to take towers offline for maintenance. I got some pictures to show you of, of some tower painting we did this year. And, or if you have a major break, you know, how are you still going to keep a hospital for per se, in operation if you have to take a major component offline, which was a condition we just faced this year. Um, asset management, we're now required by the state of Michigan to um, have an asset management plan and do asset management updates. Um, so, you know, considering things like material lifespan and lifespan of, you know, concrete and keeping it available, you know, having corrosion protection for it and such. Um, you know, redundancy, again, having the ability that if one thing goes down, you're still going to maintain full service. Um, having proper utility location underground, you know, once utilities are installed underground, it's very important to be able to know exactly where those are in the future, because you're always going to be coming in contact with those again. And then really the human factor, um, you know, humans are going to operate your water and sewer systems. And I kind of look at it like driving a car, you know, like, what car do you want to drive? Do I want to work at a wastewater plant, um, you know, that has, you know, quality equipment, um, is newer, you know, has good SCADA systems and things like that that allow for remote monitoring, you know, or do I want to drive the 1975 standard shift, you know, with no backup camera, no air conditioning, you know, as, um, you know, as we have to get our employees to invest and be engaged in their workplace, 
um, you know, these things are important to consider in design is how attractive can you make that facility for people to want to be there day in and day out and come to work every day. Um, just a little background on us. Um, we're a Southeast Michigan utility. Um, we're located basically right, right here um, is where we're located off I-96. Uh, we serve the geographic area around Howell and um, east all the way to the city of Brighton. So we cover 36 square miles. So um, pretty big, big uh, geographic area. Uh, we have about 20,000 um, residents and businesses that we serve. Um, our water plant is capable of doing 12 million gallons a day, and our wastewater plant can treat 3.2 million gallons a day. You may wonder why that's a big discrepancy. Our, our water system serves four townships, and our wastewater only serves two. So that's kind of why there's a discrepancy there. Um, we employ 25 people full time, and then we also have three um, seasonal employees that work for us in the summer. Um, we have an engineering internship, and then um, also some people that do grass cutting and hydrant painting and things like that. And uh, from a political standpoint, it's quite challenging because we serve four different townships um, and we serve three different governing bodies, the MHOG Sewer and Water Authority Board, the GEO Sewer and Water Authority Board, and Genoa Charter Township. So um, sometimes it's it's challenging to you know, meet all their different political viewpoints that they have. And I'm on the right hand side here. I just have a picture of a we were just featured in a magazine this past year for MWA Waters for having a winning team culture. Um, we have one of the youngest operation staffs. As, as you guys graduate and start working on wastewater and water plants, you'll find that you know a lot of the population of operators and such is, is getting up there. And you know we have a lot of people in their 20s and 30s that we're very excited about um, to continue on um, this operation tradition. So um, just uh, something we're, we're quite proud of. Um, so let me just take you on a little virtue or two of our water plant first. Um, this is our MHOG water treatment plant from an aerial standpoint. Um, so these smaller buildings you see out here in the corner, these are well houses, and I'll take you inside one of those here um, shortly. Um, this is our actual plant. It's actually two plants in one. Um, this was the original plant that was built in 1998. Um, it was a 4 million gallon a day plant, and then we added another 8 million gallon a day uh, treatment plant here. Um, we use groundwater as our source, um, which is um, in some ways a lot easier um, to deal with because it's very constant unlike a surface water plant. Um, we have a, a building here. Uh, this is our storage building um, that we have for all of our parts and materials we need for repairs. Um, and then these big ponds you see out here, these are lime lagoons. Um, so we use anhydrous lime. These are lime silos on the outside of the plant that we store anhydrous lime. Um, and then waste lime um, following the softening process is, is discharged to these lagoons. Uh, we decant the water off and then uh, the lime is eventually hauled away annually. Um, to be spread on fields as a, as a soil sweetener um, to adjust the pH of, of farm field soil. Um, so this is our well house, um, one, of the, one of our well houses. Um, this one is equipped with a variable frequency drive, which is very important. Um, it allows us to modulate the flow of the well from anywhere from you know, 1 million gallons a day to 2 million gallons a day production from this well. Um, our wells are bedrock, bedrock wells. They're 400 feet deep. Um, and uh, they're, they're screened in the, uh, in, in the bedrock. Uh, this is a flow meter here where we can you know, determine what our flow is and then we can modify the VFD to match our, our demand conditions uh, from this well. As we go inside, our water comes into our plant and then goes up this long tube here. And this is what we do for um, our iron removal. As you know, groundwater in Michigan is very high iron content. Um, so we, we basically, the well has enough force to shoot it up into the air. Um, and then it goes up onto our roof. Um, and then it goes into this cage here. And this cage here um, is, is full of a, basically a bunch of wiffle balls and it aerates the, the groundwater very quickly. And so what it does is it converts the ferrous dissolved iron from the groundwater into ferric iron. Um, and then this is just a close up view of that cascading structure um, on our roof that we, we spray the water up through and then it goes back down the outside of that cone that you saw inside. And then it reaches our clericone. Um, this clericone is 70 feet in diameter. Um, and this is capable of treating 8 million gallons a day or softening 8 million gallons a day of water. Um, water enters the, the bottom of the clericone um, through, through this here. So once it comes down that tube, gravity forces it into here. And uh, you can see how it's kind of off to the side. The idea here is that we swirl the water up through that giant cone. And then we apply a lime from the surface. And the rate of lime falling will match the rate of water climbing and we'll form a lime blanket. And then as water passes through that, the iron, the manganese, 
and a lot of the hardness are removed from the water. Uh oh, what happened? Um, this is just an overall surface view. So these tubes here you see are um, going to assist provide lime slurry. So we take the anhydrous lime, mix it with water, and um, and drop it down into a drop tube here. And then this is the overflow. So the water as it rises up um, overflows um, into a into this weir structure here. Um, so it looks like a giant swimming pool. Um, it's actually great to be in there in the summertime because the temperature of the room is about 60 degrees all year round. Uh, it holds a constant temperature. Um, from that, it goes into these structures here. Um, these are Rick, called recar. Yes. Rick, can I? Can you just go back one slide? I just wanted to sure. ask you something real quick. Yeah. So, in the East Lansing plant, the all of the t the piping for um, the lime is all flexible piping. And I noticed that yours is the same. Yep. Because of the issues with clogging. I Correct. presume that's the same. So can you just mention that just because um, we've never talked about it, but I think it's an important kind of consideration in terms of. Yeah. So when the plan was originally designed, we had PVC pipes. And as you know, in, yeah, the anhydrous lime will form some rocks and stuff in it. You know, it gets hard especially overnight, like when the plant shuts down at night and then that lime sits in there, it settles out. And so we were having a lot of trouble with um, clogging. And then because it was PVC pipe, we never could tell where it was clogged. So we went to using flexible clear pipe, um, so this, this Tiger Flex tubing. And basically it's, it's nice because if we do get a clog, we can kind of see where it is. And then all you have to do is basically pull out a section replace it, splice it back together, you can quickly be back in operation and then operators can work to clean that out, you know, out in the parking lot and stuff afterwards to get, get the lime clog out of there. So um, it's a much better, easier way to go. And that's, yeah, that's why we switched to this as well. And Fenton has lime softening too, and they do the, they did the same thing. Thank you, sorry to interrupt, but I thought- Oh, no it was problem. Just... So yeah, from, from, so from our claret cone, it goes into these recarbonation tanks. So when the lime, because lime is very basic, our, our water coming off our cone has a pH of about 10. Uh, we try to have our water pH right around eight to 8.2, because that's kind of where the human body likes it and provides the best taste. Um, so what we do is we provide, we, we bubble carbon dioxide. Um, we have liquefied carbon dioxide storage, uh, cryogenic storage of carbon dioxide, then we bubble it through um, to bring, you know, the pH of the water back down. So we just, in these recarbs, the pH down to um, 8.2. Uh, 8 uh, from there, um, we apply it to our, our sand filters. So our sand filters are a mixture of um, anthracite, coal, and then sand. Um, that removes any particulate lime that's remaining. Um, and then we have these backwash structures here that are capable um, of, of backwashing. So as the, we have a sonic level sensor, so as the water level rises, as the water is applied at the surface, you know, it, we call for it to backwash periodically. So about once a week, um, we have to backwash each, each filter at our plant. And again, that's depending on demand. Um, from there, it goes to our high service uh, pumps. So we have a clear well. So we add chlorine to it at that point. Uh, we also add fluoride, a very small amount of fluoride. Uh, for dental health, we match the um, American Dental Society's uh, recommendations of about 0.7 milligrams per liter for fluoride. And we have naturally occurring about 0.45 milligrams per liter. So it's a very, very small amount. Um, and then we have these high service pumps. Um, each one is capable of 2 million gallons a day, uh, or actually 2.5 million gallons a day. And uh, so we can pump our water out. We actually have two clear wells. I mentioned we had two plants. So we use pumps on this side as well as the other side of our plant. That way we never have to re-disinfect our, our clear wells. We always keep them uh, properly chlorinated. Um, another thing we have nice in our plant is we have skated screens throughout our plant. So um, at each process, so this is in front of the sand filters, we have a SCADA screen. Um, this way when operators are out in the plant, they can change processes anywhere they are. They don't have to go back to a main central computer. Um, these are all interlinked and uh, they can do everything on hand and everything we have is a touch screen too. So they can do either with a mouse or they, you know, they can touch and, and, um, and make their operational changes. So that way when they're backwashing a filter, they can actually physically watch the backwash cycle going on, you know, while they do the work in front of it. So um, it's a nice feature to have the SCADA screens. And then we also have a whole major SCADA system 
Uh, this is a big television we have in our lab. And this is our whole distribution system. So it has each of our towers, um, all of our booster stations to raise levels. And then um, another thing we're very proud of is, is our SCADA. Um, you know, it, it does a great job. And then we uh, also have it available on our phone. So operators are on call can actually log in uh, through a double security password um, and see their SCADA screens and make changes and stuff or, or act um, you know, act to acknowledge alarms and stuff remotely and see what's going on. Um, because this is an F licensed facility, which is a full treatment facility, we have to have an operator, a licensed operator on staff at all times that the plan is running. So um, it has to be physically staffed by a person whenever we're producing water. It can't run 100% um, remotely. Um, and this is just a view of one of the lime lagoons. Um, so each day, um, you know, our lime, when we shut the plant down, the lime settles and then we'll waste off a portion of the old lime um, and it goes into these lagoons. And then, like I said, it, it gets uh, taken off annually um, for, uh, for farm fields, to be used in farm fields. And then the decant water goes out to the Red Cedar River, which actually flows through um, your, the campus at Michigan State. So um, this is at the headwaters of that river. And we have an NPDES permit uh, for the discharge of that, that water to the river. Um, talking about the creature comforts for operators, this is just one of the things we have. We have a workshop slash big storage barn. We just built this in 2019. Um, so we have a loader in there for you know, loading equipment and such, pipe. Um, because of the, we're finding that we stock almost every repair part that we need. Because um, inevitably breaks will occur on Christmas, uh, Sunday, you know, when, when places aren't open. Um, so, you know, we keep a full supply of valves. Um, on hand, uh, meters, um, we keep all of our repair parts. These are all mega lugs um, and uh, glands and sleeves and 45s and 22 degrees and T's. Um, you know, we keep um, everything. This is a uh, distribution piping. Um, if you hear about like lead services being replaced, this is primarily what it's being replaced with, which is um, high density polyethylene one inch piping. And uh, we use this for all of our repairs. Um, to water services, which that's actually the bulk of our repairs is repairing water services to homes and businesses. Um, so we stock everything, especially now with material shortages and uh, supply chain issues, you know, by keeping everything in stock, it allows us to quickly re do repairs and, and get people back in service as quickly as we possibly can. Um, this is our distribution system. So uh, the, the water plant I showed you was, was right here. Um, and then uh, we go all the way to the city of Brighton limits here. So as the crow flies, it's about 12 miles and then we cover 36 square miles. And um, we have, um, you know, ground storage tanks that hold 5 million gallons of water. And then we have um, three other ele elevated storage, four elevated storage tanks um, in the air. So in total, we keep about 6.8 million gallons of water in the air at any given time, um, which is more than our peak daily demand, um, which is a nice, um, feature to have um, it allows us to you know to shut down for extended periods of time from production. Um, we also have interconnects with the city of Howell um, for reliability purposes, as well as interconnects with the city of Brighton um, for reliability purposes. And these are just some stats. We have about 160 miles of water main, um, close to 1,800 fire hydrants. Each of those is flushed and maintained each year. Um, we have 2,000 valves. Again, each of those we try to do about 25% of those that we exercise each year. And um, we also have five booster stations. Um, each of our booster stations, we have the ability to add chlorine. So it allows us to keep our chlorine low, leaving our facility here and then boost it up as we get further from the plant. This helps keep down our um, you know, chlorinated hydrocarbons from forming in our water, keeps our water quality much better, um, you know, because we can add just a slight amount here um, to provide our disinfection potential all the way out. Um, just, I just want to share with you a little bit about distribution maintenance. Um, this is one of our, we painted two water towers this year. Um, this is our Osceola water tower. Uh, this is it there. This was it primed um, after sandblasting. These towers were put in in the late 90s. So about 22 to 25 years old. Um, all the coatings had to be basically stripped down to bare metal and recoded. Um, so this was kind of the primed and then they're putting the base coat on and then this was the finished product. Um, this is Genoa, um, also at the campus of Clear University. Um, this is the rigging that they put on to contain the, provide the containment unit. So 
Um, fortunately, our pro towers were put in in the, in the 90s, so we didn't have to contend with lead paint, but some of your older communities may have lead paint to contain with on our older water towers. So definitely containment is a, is a huge factor to you know, protect the environment and the surrounding um, residents. So that just shows you the containment structure. Um, once you're inside of it, this just shows the sandblasting process. Um, it's actually quite a horrible job. Um, you know, it's very loud, um, dusty, dirty. Um, so we really appreciate the painters that go through the work to do this. Um, so this is them stripping off um, you know, the old light blue paint. Um, and then here it is completed um, for the softball baseball field at Cleary. We you know, we put their logo on there and made it look nice for them. And then you know for the Genoa Township, we we put their logo on as well. I'm trying to provide a little community pride with our water towers. Um, this is inside of a one of our ground storage tanks. This is a million gallon ground storage tank. We had the interior painted, um, so this just shows you the inside of that. Um, this stuff you see here on the uh, the bottom. Sorry. Um, this is our uh, cathodic protection. Um, so there's sacrificial anodes in here um, to help prevent the tank from rusting, again, to prolong the life of that structure. Um, these are just some, uh, some pictures. This is a 16 inch water main installation that's ongoing. Um, this is a, a large break we had. You can see the damage that results from that with you know um, flooding and stuff. Actually a hydrant blew off and this was a, a basically a six inch opening flowing full. Um, so you can imagine if like a 42 inch or 24 inch main goes, it's it's huge volume of water. Um, this is just our annual maintenance of fire hydrants. Every year, every fire hydrant is operated. Um, so for water quality, we we flush this to get any debris out of the mains. You know, we 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 pull a velocity through the mains of about 1,200 gallons a minute. Um, that gets any you know built up sediment and stuff out of there. Um, also, make sure that the fire hydrants are there for fire protection for the residents um, in the future. And, uh, you know, just keeps our overall water quality up uh, as part of doing that. Um, this is one of our booster stations. Um, it's actually pumps to two different towers. There's four pumps in here. And again, reliability, everything we have is at least a duplex. You know, we always have one pump in case one's out of service uh, to keep our firm capacity. And this is just a water main repair. Um, so we install the valve um, onto the main. Um, we're putting a fire hydrant on there. And then uh, this is a sleeve that will go where we join the two mains together um, with mega lugs. You know, and these are restrained joints. Um, almost everything nowadays is restrained joints on, on water main. It keeps it safer uh, for, the, for the operators in the future. Um, another thing we're, we're quite proud of is our, our modeling, our hydraulic water modeling. Um, we, uh, we have our entire distribution system uh, modeled with a, a program called InfoWater. So this just allows us to create, we, we calibrate our model, we do flow tests on all of our fire hydrants. We also put pressure gauges in all of our fire hydrants. And then uh, we, we create a water model that matches exactly what we have in our distribution system. And then we can monitor our pressures. Um, so this is our existing um, system uh, under a 4.5 MGD demand, which is about what we see in a peak summer day now. And you can see from the pressures, you know, we have some areas that are down in the 40s, but for the most part, we're anywhere, you know, try to be in the 50 to 60, 70 pound um, pressure range. Uh, if we look into the future, which is something that the state requires us to do. So as an engineer, you have to look both at your five-year growth and then your 20-year growth. So, you know, if we look in 2039, you know, 20 years from now, um, you can see our water system, it completely crashes. Uh, we're predicting that we'll have 8 million gallons a day demand there. Um, so that's what the model allows us to do is to evaluate um, those conditions in the future. Um, then we can look at improvements. So these just show some of the improvements that we could do like a new booster station, new transmission mains, um, you know, providing some loops and stuff into the system. Um, you know, overall about $14 million, $14 million worth of improvements. Uh, but then you can see if we go to 8 million gallons a day in 2039 with those improvements, again, our system um, meets all the current demand conditions. So uh, it's a very powerful tool to allow us to see what we have to do. And then from a political standpoint, it allows us to educate over time, um, you know, the boards that, that govern us so that we can get the money brought in and save the money, you know, to do these improvements and have it in the bank when time comes that we need it. Um, another thing from an engineering standpoint that we look at quite frequently is all our new developments, we're very careful to review all of our plans. Um, you know, we make sure that everything meets our standard details that we have set for our system. 
Um, we change the plans, like we'll mark up the draft set, send it back to the, um, you know, to the engineers that design it um, to make sure it meets all of our standards. Um, very, again, a very important thing for our community to make sure that everything that's being installed is there for the long term and, uh, you know, it does the best job it can. Um, concurrent with that is following plan review and making sure that the plans are accurate. We also do a lot of construction inspection. Um, so we have our engineers on staff that will be out in the field all the time with uh, the, the people building the subdivisions. You know, and we just make sure that we get accurate as built. So again, I talked about how important it is to know where your stuff is. Um, you know, again, that they're doing the work properly, like this is installing a polyethylene bag over the water main. Um, it protects the ductile iron um, from soil corrosion, you know, from having soils that have, you know, somewhat acidic conditions and stuff uh, attacking the ductile iron. So uh, we, we require a poly bag on it. So we make sure that, that gets installed properly and keep good accurate records of what gets put in per day. Um, and then a, a final component we have of our asset management is GIS. Um, we're very big on using geographic information systems and mapping. So every new subdivision, this is a new subdivision. Uh, we keep a detailed record of where the water shutter shutoff box is for that home, um, where all the valves are, where all the fire hydrants are. Um, and then in GIS, you can run multiple queries about you know, how many hydrants do I have? What maintenance needs to be done? Um, when we flush our hydrants, we have an interactive map that allows our receptionists here in the office to um, know exactly where the operators are because they turn from red to green. And then if a customer calls, like they have low water pressure, we can say, well, they're in your neighborhood and such. Um, and then all of our plans, like if you see here, this FTP document link um, right here, all of our plans are linked. So uh, operators just have to click on one of these boxes and then the actual plan sheet for that will come up. So if you're out in the field and you have a repair to do, or you know, want to know how deep it is or whatever to tell your contractor for excavation of a repair or damage, uh, we can have the plans right with us in the field at all times, which is again, a very another uh, very powerful tool and, and provides for good asset management of our, of our facilities. A um, little bit about contaminants in drinking water. I just wanted to share with you. Um, we're, uh, this is our most recent lead and copper. This is from this year. So you read about some communities having uh, lead and copper. Based on the size of MHOG, we must do 30 homes a year. Um, and you can see here we have mostly non-detects for lead. We do have a couple, three, one. Um, one of the key things going back to our treatment process, um, that pH of 8.2, and by doing lime softening, we introduce a lot of alkalinity into our water. That does a great job of coating um, the inside of the pipes. Um, we're fortunate in that our system is relatively new and we do not have any lead services. Um, on any of our homes. Um, so we, you know, you can see here, the state has different tiers that you have at the bottom, like, you know, multifamily building is a tier two with lead service or with lead piping interior. Um, you know, we, the worst we have is um, lead solder and brass prior to 2014 that may contain lead. So that's where some of these, um, you know, low level concentrations come from. Um, but, uh, you know, we do our best to try to maintain um, a good protective water, to, water quality. Um, one of our systems, we do operate another smaller water system and, and that one we add phosphate again for corrosion protection um, for that very reason to make sure we keep a water quality that's you know, protective of our, of our residents. Um, it's interesting, water is one of the interesting things is that you know, it, it's really where we really meet customers, you know, we're in their houses actually. So if you think about it, that's you know, very few other utilities and operations actually get inside homes, but because we have the meters in the homes and we sample in homes, um, and actually we're responsible for the type of, our water has to be protective of whatever plumbing is in that home. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, you're definitely most in contact with any customer being in a water distribution system. And then emerging contaminants, this is just a letter we got back here on October 7th uh, from the state um, informing us that now we've been selected uh, to be a dioxin sampling site. So actually this Friday we'll be getting tested for, um, for dioxin. We do not anticipate any problems with that. Um, but again, we have to always be prepared for things like PFAS. And we've been sampled for PFAS. That's now become an annual requirement. Um, whereas three years ago, it wasn't. Um, we're very fortunate again with our very deep groundwater wells. Um, we have a very protected water source. Um, so we, 
you know, we always have to be on our guard though for, for potential future contaminants. Um, and we do operate a wellhead protection system as well to, to protect ourselves from, you know, any type of gas stations and things like that going in our wellhead area. I'd like to show you a video now. We've actually done a video. It's a 17 minute video of our wastewater system. Uh, a little more, it'll be a little more jazzy and fancy than what I showed you there at the PowerPoint. Um, uh, so let me go Greg, ahead. Greg, yeah. before you start that, we have one question sure. about the upflow clarifiers, wanting to know about redundancy um, on the clarifiers. Um, oh yeah. So that's our, our sand filters you mean or? No, on the upflow clarifiers. Oh, um, on our, so yeah, we um, so a couple of different things about redundancy. We are not required to soften water. Um, that is a uh, that is a um, aesthetic criteria. So in the worst case, we could provide. We have the ability to just pump water directly from the ground and send it out, uh, chlorinated and disinfected. Um, but then we also have two of those. We have the eight million gallon one, and we have a four million gallon one. So in a sense, we do have some redundancy on our um, our our upflow clarifiers and each year we do try to operate both um, so here in january usually between january and march we'll run our smaller plant just because everything stays better if we run it annually um, and then come summertime we we'll, usually in april we'll switch back over to our larger um, upflow clarifier claricone thanks mm -hmm. all right so let me see how i can do Hello and welcome to the Genola Seal of Wastewater Treatment Plant. My name is Greg Tatera, Utility Director for this facility. We'd like to welcome you on a tour of our facility today and as we go through that tour, we'd like to discuss some design considerations for wastewater engineering in the future. Some of the items that we'd like to focus on is handling extreme weather events, dealing with recalcitrant and bioaccumulative chemicals such as PFAS and mercury, Handling biosolids and residual management, which is becoming more and more difficult by the day. And also dealing with energy usage and the cost of energy in the future, becoming more efficient to lower your operational costs. The sources of wastewater for our facility include homes, industries, and commercial businesses such as restaurants. As wastewater leaves your home, it is conveyed to our facility through a series of collection system devices that we'd like to highlight some of the key design considerations for. First is a manhole. In looking at design considerations for manholes, we'd like to look at preventing inflow and infiltration, such as watertight covers, lining to prevent hydrogen sulfide corrosion of the concrete, as well as prevent infiltration, and also worker safety. Looking at the placement of manholes and green belts rather than the center of roadways, and then also looking at proper steps and ability to access the manhole without traffic. From manholes and pipes, wastewater then enters sanitary sewer lift stations, which function to raise the water from a lower elevation to a higher elevation. Key design considerations in designing and constructing a sanitary lift station include installing standby power, Power the station in the event of a power outage and keep the wastewater flowing to prevent sanitary sewer overflow events. Constructing the station of sufficient size, volume, and elevation so that during peak storm events, wastewater can still be conveyed and not overflow, resulting in sanitary sewer backups into homes. Location and access adjacent to homes and businesses. It's important to install odor control devices so that the stations do not become obnoxious to neighbors with odors coming from them. Installing bypass connections, such that should power or an actual pump failure occur, um, there's still an ability to bring a temporary pump in and pump the wastewater, again, to prevent sanitary sewer backups into homes or the environment. And finally, installing remote monitoring, which will allow the operators to be notified in the event of high water, power outage, or other events to quickly react to prevent releases of sanitary sewer into either homes or the environment. In addition, you'll notice this station has pink lining, once again installed to prevent hydrogen sulfide corrosion from the wastewater of the concrete structure. Following conveyance of the wastewater to our facility through pipes, pump stations, and manholes, it reaches our Headworks building. The Headworks building's primary function is to screen the wastewater of all recalcitrant debris and prepare it for 
biological nutrient removal through our biological treatment processes. Key design considerations at a Headworks building are A, constructing a fine screen that operates by level control. This way this screen is only running and consuming power when elevation reaches a certain point. Having the screen of small enough material, this one here is three millimeters in diameter, so that small material does not impact uh, mechanical processes in the facility. Having accurate flow measurement, so that we're able to accurately determine the flow coming into our facility for calculating food to mass ratios, as well as regulatory reporting to the state. Odor control, this is one of the most odoriferous portions of a wastewater treatment plant, and we didn't want those odors affecting our nearby residents and property owners. Having redundancy, such that should the mechanical screen fail, we have a way to convey wastewater through the Headworks building and still result in biological treatment. As well as corrosion protection, the wastewater coming in here is quite aged and typically has a pretty high hydrogen sulfide concentration. You'll again see the peak lining material that we've applied to our concrete to prevent corrosion of the concrete structures. These are all key items to consider in designing a Headworks building. From our Headworks building, wastewater is transferred to an equalization tank underground. From this EQ tank, we have two pipes emanating that allow us to split flow between our two oxidation ditch biological nutrient removal structures. In this way, we can either split flow 50-50 between the two devices or provide more, more flow to one oxidation ditch or more to another. And it provides our operators the greatest flexibility in controlling flow between the two biological treatment devices. One of the key design considerations for any engineer in developing a wastewater treatment plant is to provide operational personnel with as many flexibilities as possible to handle all the different events that occur in wastewater treatment. From our flow plant structure, our wastewater enters our oxidation ditch. The first step in our oxidation ditch is called the selector basin. The selector basin aids in biological nutrient removal, allowing us to use much less chemical to conduct the removal of phosphorus, a key nutrient in wastewater removal. Wastewater is introduced with return activated sludge in a very anoxic environment, resulting in the bacteria releasing phosphorus under this condition. And then as we reach through high oxygen at the end of the process, the phosphorus is uptaken, removing it from the wastewater and meeting our permit limits for discharge to the receiving stream. One of the key design considerations in any oxidation process for our biological nutrient removal, as well as BOD removal, is low energy usage. Oxidation ditches provide good oxygen delivery at relatively low energy costs compared to forced driven air or fine bubble diffuser systems. Other key design considerations for biological removal include chemical addition, having the ability to add chemicals such as ferric chloride or aluminum sulfate to precipitate phosphorus from the stream, or also possibly polymer to result in help in the settling of biological solids, having sufficient hydraulic capacity to handle storm events and surges that occur during large storm events, having efficient oxygen delivery. Again, our oxidation ditch here um, uses rotors, which is a very efficient process and results in lower energy costs for us while providing efficient oxygen delivery into the water, as well as sufficient mixing. One of the other key things that we've added to our oxidation ditch system is meters that allow operators to quickly see redox potential as well as oxygen concentrations in each of the treatment trains in the oxidation ditch. In this way, operators can adjust the level, change oxygen conditions to provide the most efficient removal of BOD, ammonia, and phosphorus from the waste stream as part of the biological treatment process. Following the oxidation treatment process, wastewater then enters our final effluent clarifiers. Some of the key design considerations for final effluent clarifiers are sufficient hydraulic capacity to handle storm surges, efficient rotary scraping of the surface as well as the bottom for low energy usage, installation of covers over the final effluent weirs keeping these free of algae and other growth of biological material, which reduces labor of our staff, as well as allows for even overflow throughout the final clarifier. In addition, 
The scraper arm should have a scum beach on it to allow for the collection of grease and other recalcitrant compounds off the surface, which are then transported through the gravity system back to our headworks building for further treatment again through the process. Sludge that's collected at the bottom of the clarifiers goes into our return activated sludge building. Here a portion is either returned back into the oxidation treatment process or wasted to allow for proper population growth and control of microorganisms relative to the food that's coming in in the wastewater treatment stream. In our building we use three different types of pumps for redundancy as well as different flow rates to allow operators again the most flexibility in controlling the return activated sludge rates and the wasting rates for the best biological treatment of the wastewater. From the final effluent clarifiers, waste activated sludge is transferred to sludge storage tanks. From here it is pumped through a screw press which thickens the sludge to a consistency of about 21% solids. Here it is put into dumpsters and transferred to a landfill. Our facility used to use a land disposal of biosolids. However, due to the stigma associated with this, this became difficult, as well as the variability of conditions such as crops, soil moisture, and trucking became more and more costly for us. This provides a much more efficient disposal of our biological solids from our facility. Eventually, our facility would like to look at going to a Class A biosolid where this material could possibly be utilized again for fertilizer or reuse rather than disposal in a landfill. Effluent water overflowing the weirs in the clarifier is then transferred to our tertiary treatment process. Our facility uses aqua aerobics final effluent filters. This is a disc design where wastewater filters through a fabric material and then transfers to the final UV disinfection. Material is then vacuumed off that collects on the filters by pumps and transferred to the headworks of the building for retreatment. This is a very efficient method of conducting final effluent filtering and provides good phosphorus removal in the event that biological removal is not sufficient to meet our final effluent limits. From the final effluent filters, wastewater is then transferred through UV disinfection banks. The UV disinfection process is again very energy efficient and much safer than using chlorine or other methods of disinfection. Operators must keep a key eye though to make sure that bulb intensity and material does not build up on the bulbs so that killing of viruses and bacteria occurs before disposal of the wastewater into the final effluent stream so that it remains protective of human contact in the future use of this wastewater. Some of the key design considerations for a disinfection system include ease of maintenance, having a way to change bulbs easily for operators, also having redundancy, such that having sufficient number of bulbs and UV systems, should that one go down, there's plenty of UV disinfection potential available, as well as safety, making sure that the operators are shielded from the UV rays, and this is one of the advantages of UV over chlorine, is that it's also a much safer technology to use for operators rather than chlorine gas disinfection, which was historically used in the past. You can see here our final effluent outfall. One of the key components of an outfall is typically to provide a little additional aeration of the water before introduction into the receiving stream. You can see our facility uses a cascade design to oxygenate the water. We remain very proud of our effluent quality. As you can see here, this water is equally clear as a receiving stream water. And one of our goals is to protect the environment and provide an effluent that is better and cleaner than the water in the normal receiving stream. No wastewater treatment plant would be complete without a proper SCADA system. SCADA stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. This is the computer system that allows the operators to interface with each component of the treatment process. Some of the key design considerations for SCADA include cybersecurity, making sure that our system is locked out from outside influences that may want to create harm or do damage to our treatment process. Usability, we want to make sure that operators can easily interface with this and you can see that we've constructed this to look exactly like our wastewater treatment plant. Alarm notifications. We want to make sure that operators are easily notified of alarm conditions 
and that the alarm conditions can be set by senior personnel so that everyone knows um, if it's a very important alarm or not. Also, storage of process information is another key component of any system. We want to make sure that we're logging all the flow data and all the process control data in the system for future use and evaluation by operators as they adjust treatment processes. Finally, we want it to be intuitive. We want the operator interface to be easy to use and understand so that the operators are comfortable using it no matter what. Our system is able to be used in phones remotely as well as here in the plant itself. A key component of any wastewater treatment plant design is to understand the human factor. The fact that human beings are going to be here day in and day out operating this facility, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. As a result, we want to design a facility in a manner that makes their jobs easy, comfortable, and efficient. A key consideration in the wastewater treatment plant design is the laboratory. Decisions need to be made early on in the design process with regard to what analytical processes is this lab going to be able to conduct. In our facility, we're able to conduct nearly all processes required to meet our NPDES permit, with the exception of metals analysis. In our lab here, you'll see we have stations set up for chemical biological oxygen demand, phosphorus measurements, ammonia measurements, pH measurements, as well as key process data such as volatile suspended solids, mixed liquor suspended solids concentrations, and settleability. And thinking of the human aspect of a wastewater treatment plant, it's important to also consider workspace, creature comforts, and equipment material storage as part of the overall treatment process. Workspace is key for operators to have room to view their SCADA screens, research where to buy replacement materials, as well as do such little tasks such as timesheets or write short memos. Creature comforts are important too. Wastewater being a dirty business, we provided laundry facilities for our staff, showers, lockers, and a lunchroom to try to make their jobs as easy as possible and as comfortable as possible considering the difficult nature of the work that they conduct. Finally, it's very important to consider equipment and material storage. You want to have sufficient space to store replacement materials, especially as our supply chain difficulties increase day in and day out. There's a large amount of equipment that also gets used for wastewater treatment. and You want to make sure you build storage for that, such as a vector truck for cleaning pump stations and sanitary sewers, material handling equipment, such as a Manitou for handling residuals in the facility, as well as such things such as lawnmowers, pumps, pressure washers, and other equipment that's necessary to keep the plant clean and spotless. We thank you for joining us on our facility tour. Uh, we hope we've highlighted some of the key considerations as you look at designing wastewater treatment plants for the future, and we hope that you're able to join us at the General Osea Wastewater Treatment Plant Facility again in the future. Um, so in conclusion, I, I guess um, uh, I just want to go over a couple of the, the challenges that are going to be uh, upcoming um, for engineers and for us operators as well. Um, you know, we see time and time again, uh, greater customer service is required. Um, residents are demanding, you know, better product. You know, they want to be assured that what they're getting delivered to their home is 100% safe um, and of a high quality. You know, no iron, no foul odors, no foul smells. Um, you know, so we, we take very, you know, making sure that you design a system that's capable of producing high quality water, um, you know, is going to be another challenge in the future. Um, emerging contaminants, you know, like I said, those things are coming. And, you know, unfortunately, like our biological treatment process at our wastewater plant does not have an ability to remove PFAS. So if we had that in our system, you know, we would have to be able to construct something that could handle that, such as, you know, carbon, liquid phase carbon uh, filtration at the end or something to, to do that. So, you know, uh, any system has to be adaptable to be able to add more treatment processes onto it, um, you know, to, to potentially reach these emerging contaminants. And then, you know, on the water side, source protection is key. Um, you know, protecting that groundwater source that we have is of most important to us. You know, that's that's there for the long haul and we want to make sure it stays, you know, pristine as, as it possibly can. 
Um, on the wastewater side and even on the water side, our residuals management, you know, what are you going to do with the waste products that you have? You know, on the water side, like RO discharge, you know, what are you going to do if you have an RO plant, reverse osmosis plant, and you have the high salt and, you know, high total dissolved solid waste from that? You know, wastewater plants are going to be getting total dissolved solid limits on them, as I understand, coming soon. So, you know, that's going to be a challenge of where, how are you going to handle that, that waste? And on the wastewater side, you know, our, our biosolids, um, you know, sending it to a landfill is not the best thing we want to do with it. You know, what, you know, how can we convert it into something that's usable in the future and possibly even convert it into energy of some kind? You know, those are the types of things that I, I see coming down, um, coming down the pipe. Another one is operator recruitment and retention. Um, you know, I think historically, you know, when the Clean Water Act was passed in the 70s and everyone got into the field, you know, it was nice because it was a stable job that gave you good benefits. Well, that's, you know, that's not what people want today. You know, they want to be engaged in their, in their workplace. And, um, you know, how are we going to, how are we going to build facilities that keep people engaged? Um, you know, some of the things I didn't show you there is we, we have a little weight room uh, that we put in our biosolids building for the guys to, you know, while they're sitting there for hours on end, they can work out a little bit. Um, you know, we do uh, uh, an Olympics event each year where we have um, competitions between our different work groups and, you know, then we have a prize at the end and stuff for lunch and a trophy and stuff that we give out to try to keep people engaged and, you know, in, in, in their work and pride in their own individual, you know, groups, whether it's the water guys versus the wastewater guys versus the office staff, you know, we, we try to do things like that. Um, and then replacing aging and unsafe infrastructure, you know, where's the, where's the money going to come for that? Um, you know, it's, it's quite expensive uh, and, and things are going up, you know, group, huge now. Um, right now it's very difficult to even get a bid on a job, you know, with contractors and pipe prices because, you know, they don't know how long. So historically, you know, we would do a job, bid it out, and the contractor would hold it for 90 days. Well, you know, now they'll hold the price for two days. Um, so those are some of the challenges you're going to have as engineers is how to get over those types of, of hurdles in the future. What we've done is we've fortunately have a big enough staff and expertise that we're, we're becoming like the general contractors and we're buying everything ahead of time. And then once we have all the parts and materials here, then we'll bid the job um, because then the contractor has assurances that, you know, they're not going to be hit with a big price increase and they know everything is there. And that's how we're kind of handling that going forward. So um, with all these things coming down a pipe, you know, it's kind of like Herb Brooks always said, great moments are born from great opportunity. I think that's what we're going to have is, you know, I try not to look at things with a glass half empty. I try to look at them half full and, you know, all these are is opportunities that we have to do things better in the future. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions anybody has or anything. Hopefully you, Hopefully I just gave you a little perspective from an operator of, you know, what, what operators are going to be dealing with and what, how we can make designs better for them in the future. Well, thank you, Gary. Um, we do have one question in the chat. Okay. Uh, so this was really cool and I enjoyed the design tips along the tour, along with the tour. I was wondering why you elected to get your PhD and if a lot of treatment plant directors have them. Um, no, a lot do not. Um, <clears throat> I elected to get it because I was kind of a weird student. I had a biology degree. I was always into the outdoors. And so when I graduated with my undergrad, I only had a biology degree. And Michigan State at the time had the Center for Microbial Ecology. So it allowed me to work um, cross discipline. So I was able to get my PhD actually in microbiology and be in a microbiology department. But then all my research was done out in the engineering research complex and in the engineering department. So it gave me the, the cross discipline to do that. And that's why um, I elected to do it. But um, I guess it's you know funny, we never know exactly how we're gonna end up. And I always saw myself, um, when I was a biology major in undergrad, I wanted to be a teacher. And all through my PhD work, I thought I would be a professor. And then I started working in the field and I just fell in love with doing field work and stuff. And that's how I ended up basically becoming a utility director is I just like the field aspect of it. Greg, actually, I did not realize that your PhD was in micro. Until yeah, yeah I, it, well, until I was looking up to um, <clears throat> to let the students know, you know, who you were. And then I'm like, oh, OK, because for those of you, um, all of 
Greg worked with Dr. Criddle, who was in civil environmental engineering. All his research was out in the research complex. So I assumed your degree was environmental engineering until I saw otherwise. Uh, so it's, it was actually a really neat program in terms of the ability to do cross-disciplinary research. And oh yeah, and I love the wastewater class. That was the other thing is I love the wastewater classes like EV 804, and I got to be the TA for 804 and do the 805 lab and everything. So I loved all that. Any other questions? Um, okay, so did you learn more about all these treatment processes and uh, process equipment on the job or in school? Uh, mostly on the job. Mostly on the job. I, I learned the basics on the, uh, you know, in, in the coursework and, and, you know, how to design into calculations and hydraulic flows and all that. But the actual equipment, um, I learned on the job. You know, I, I always made it a point to go tour a lot of different facilities to, um, you know, see as much as I can to talk to as many people as I can. I, you know, belong to the Michigan Water Environment Association, the American Water Works Association. I attend their conferences, to, you know, to see how other people do things. And, um, you know, mostly it was all, almost all on the job. couple of comments. Uh, really enjoyed the emphasis on the operators too, because they always know the most about the process. And I just want to add that, and Greg mentioned it, but um, Scott DeVries from the Williamston plant, when we do the tours there, always mentioned it too. When you're designing a plant or designing an upgrade, talk to the operators, because they know what works. They know what doesn't work. And I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Um, Greg? Yeah, they do. I mean, and I think an engineer that's capable of communicating with operators is, is key, you know, if getting, you know, just being able to sit down and talk to them, um, you know, they, they want us, you know, you guys both want, I always think operators and engineers both want the exact same thing. You know, we both want to produce the highest quality, either water or wastewater effluent. And, you know, it's just how are we going to get there? And, you know, I, I think the operators can give a lot of examples to, you know, things that maybe haven't worked in the past or the problems that they're having. And then as the engineer, you know, you can solve those problems and kind of become, you know, their, you know, their hero and stuff. And I think another thing the engineers can bring is, you know, because you're going to be working for larger firms and stuff with a lot of experience, you know, you can bring different ideas. So like, for example, like when we were doing our biosolids and, and we were having issues with land application, and we were running out of capacity to store sludge and then have it land applied. It was really the engineers that brought, um, you know, the pressing idea to us. And they took us to a different facility that they designed in Grand Rapids and showed it to us and stuff. And, you know, that's kind of what sold us on it. So um, I think, you know, being able to talk and then being a little bit of a salesman to operators is, is also a good thing too. Um, but I think the most important is, yeah, what, you know, what, do they want and what can you do to kind of make their jobs easier? Because it is a hard job. I mean, if I had a dollar for every time I got called after hours, you know, I, I wouldn't be sitting here anymore. I'd be retired. So, because um, it never ends, you know, you never know when something's going to break. You know, the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving this past week, you know, we had stuff going on. So, you know, you, you never know. Oh, yeah. And even from the, you know, even from the public, too, you know, they're funny because they'll call sometimes at five o'clock on Friday and go, well, you know, two days ago, I started noticing I was having pressure problems, but I thought I'd call you now. Well, gee, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Like, it could have called us two days ago, you know, so you deal with that kind of stuff as well. Let's thank Greg. Really appreciate him here um, being here. Go Green.